and welcome to Virtua Health's Real Talk Women's, I mean, tonight's men's health chat. I'm Nicole Mohalik from 92.5 XTU, and I'm so excited to be your host for tonight's event. We're really excited to welcome some men here, get you healthy, get you excited. All right. Primary care physician Richard Levine and gastroenterologist Christopher Morrison, and we'd like to give a little background of them. So Dr. Levine graduated from medical school at the Medical College of PA and did his residency in family medicine at Virtua. He's currently one of our medical directors for Virtua Primary Care and is the lead physician at Virtua Primary Care of Cherry Hill. Dr. Levine enjoys reading, learning Spanish, and playing with his four dogs. Dr. Morrison completed his medical education at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and an internal medicine residency at Boston University. He completed a fellowship in gastroenterology at Temple University, joined a private group in Texas for six years before returning to South Jersey, and in his spare time, he enjoys tennis, cooking, and the arts. So welcome, everyone. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. You're welcome. You guys have a lot of exciting stuff going on besides five. So thanks for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Appreciate it. Um, all right, we're going to jump right in. So why do men af- avoid going to the doctor? Dr. Levine, if you want to jump in on that, we're just going to make it really general and go from there. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, you know, women tend to go to their gynecologists relatively often starting maybe in their late teens, early 20s, men don't have to do that. So men tend not to go to the doctor unless a spouse or significant other says, hey, you really need to go get checked out or their parents tell them, or now they're in their 30s or they're about to have a child and like, oh my God, I need to go get my tetanus shot with whooping cough. So a lot of men just have not been going to the doctor for a while. Yeah, because it is interesting because it seems like that the women in general like lead the family, right? Like the mom Mm. or the wife say as a kid. But then when like if they have a son who turns 18, he goes to college, he goes on his own. He like doesn't really go to the doctor. And then, like you said, if he gets married, he might start going again. But I feel like that needs to be talked about more, right? About especially because pre-screening is such a thing right now. Right. So going to your doctor once in your 20s, like once every other year or something like that, to to really get a nice family history and a social history, see what your risk factors are, see what screening tests we need to do. There's immunizations we give. You know, the last tetanus shot is usually at the 11 or 12 year well child visit. We should get one every 10 years. So at round 22, you should get another one. Yeah. And it's really important for everybody to, as an adult, right? Because so many people have like a pediatrician, but when they're adult, they need to establish their own primary care physician. So then they know when to get their annual exams and like their routine screenings. Right. And when they're sick, it's nice to have what's called a medical home. I tell my patients, welcome to your medical home away from home. Yeah. So what do you think the biggest misconceptions are that men have about going to the doctor? That they don't need to. Yeah. 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 And do you think that they have, you think that it's an insecurity of like, they don't want to know, or you think they're just like, I'm fine. I I think it's the latter. I think they feel that they're just fine. They don't need to go. Why should they go get blood work? They feel great. Okay. Interesting. All right. So what are some preventative measures that men can take for their health in general, before we kind of dive into some of like the nitty gritty stuff? Well, it's always good to get your blood pressure checked. Again, once a year, once every other year, screen for diabetes so we can do blood sugar tests, getting that stethoscope put on a patient. You know, sometimes we pick up heart murmurs that no one knew that they had, you know, um, talking about, about body mass index. You know, it's always a good time to talk about exercise. I tell my patients exercise is pretty much my answer for everything. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. And I don't necessarily talk about prostate exams, just so you know. Um, we, you know, we might screen for prostate cancer, depending on risk factors at age 40 or 50, but a lot of the medical literature doesn't talk about doing a rectal exam, more of a blood test, but Chris might argue with that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get to that in a second. Um, yeah. So here's the thing. When you think about it, right? So you, uh, if, if you're in school and you have to like get a physical for high school or college, and then all of a sudden you're a professional, when really should you kind of start going to, would you recommend, because like, let's talk about like the, the metabolic blood panel or just your cole- your blood work for your cholesterol. Like when should men really start diving into that? Like, should they start doing that at 18? 
That's a very good question. I, I mean, I would usually probably start maybe when they're done college. Yeah. So they're probably going to have a physical or some kind of exam before they start college, but not everyone goes to college. So, you know, maybe around age 20, 21, get that started. Yeah. It is so true now that I'm thinking about even myself personally. So I have a younger brother, but I have hypothyroid. So like I have been getting sometimes blood work twice a year since I was like 20. And it was just, it's just super, it's just normal part of like my routine and, and the whole thing where I don't, I have to text my brother and I'll be like, Andrew, when was the last time you got your blood work checked? <laughs> I just think it's so important that to establish that connection with your primary care doc. So yeah. if you have questions, you can ask. Because a lot of patients, you know, they have questions, they just don't feel they can ask. And now with the, the amazing computer system at virtual, we have Epic, patients can ask what's called a MyChart message. So they can ask things that they might have been afraid to ask in person. Yeah, that's a good question too. Like you, with, with a telemedicine visit, people could send you both messages at any time and ask you random stuff that they've may seen or anything like that. Sorry, a message just popped yeah. up. Right, yeah. so we do have telemedicine. Telemedicine is great. So primary care providers, even GI doctors can do televisits. Yeah. Virtua actually has a whole telemedicine practice. You know, so a lot of people work all day. Their hours aren't conducive to necessarily leaving to get to the doctors. Uh, so they can do a telemedicine appointment because a lot of times you don't need to put that stethoscope on them. But I like to put the stethoscope yeah. on them. Yeah, I mean, the fact that people like would not go to the doctor because they're at work, that's a we could do a whole other panel just on that, right? right. Um, so before we're going to jump, jump into the colonoscopy in a second, but we should talk about prostate, right? And so should men really get their prostate checked every single year from the time that they're in their early 20s? Or should they wait until they're a little bit older? I'll start, Chris. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right. So the, the the screening recommendations are actually very controversial about screening yeah. for prostate cancer because there's just not a ton of evidence that screening for it has saved a lot of lives. There's a little bit of evidence, but I treat my patients like family. I just turned 57 today. And Your birthday's today? And I get my prostate <laughs> screen. Thank you. With a PSA, with, with a blood test. Yeah. So depending on risk factors, I would start at 50, but if you have a family history, we would start 10 years younger when then that first degree relative was diagnosed. Certain populations like African-American men are at higher risk. I might start at age 40 and I would do it every year, every other year, usually until they're at least 70. And I will say too that um, a lot of men have a misconception that the rectal exam you get at the primary care doctor's office for a prostate exam is sufficient for a colorectal cancer screening. And, you know, you might smear the stool and get a blood sample that way, um, but it's really not intended for that purpose. So, and it's really screening for a totally different cancer. Well, what's that cancer? Well, that one is for prostate. So when you do the digital rectal exam, you're trying to actually feel the prostate through the rectum. Okay. You're not actually, um, you're feeling for any bumps or growths there. Uh, you can also do that exam if someone's having urinary symptoms and you can feel to see if it feels enlarged because a lot of men, most men get some degree of enlarged prostate as they get older. Um, but it's not really checking the colon or the rectum per se. Right. Oh, I see. What, right, right. So you are checking for prostate compared to the... Yeah. the the colonoscopy is checking for actual the colon. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it. I think a lot of men too don't really know what a prostate is. Yeah. Why you don't you explain, um, explain what that is? The prostate is a gland underneath the uh, bladder that, and the urethra or the tube that urine goes through, goes right through it. And so it's very common. In fact, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Levine, but, um, most men, a majority of men will have prostate cancer cells within their prostate at some point in their lives if you check people that are old enough. Um, but, you know, whether or not it's going to be a clinically significant cancer, is that's a bit more controversial, like he's saying. So because that prostate can get enlarged, it can squeeze and put pressure on the urethra, which can cause these urinary symptoms as, as men get older. Interesting. Why is that? Why is prostate cancer so common with men where you said that there are cells that could just live there. Do we know that yet? Or are they still studying that? The thought is that if a man lives long enough, he will get prostate cancer. It is just part of the natural course of aging. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't trying to be ageist about stopping at age no. 70. 
It's just that if someone were diagnosed all of a sudden age 70, the likelihood that they would die of prostate cancer is very slim because right. it's usually so slow growing. Now, if we diagnose it in, in their 40s or 50s, that can be a little more dangerous. So prostate cancer is probably the leading cause of cancer in men other than skin cancers, but it's the third leading cause of cancer deaths in men with wow. um, lung and colon up there. That's <laughs> really, really interesting. Um, all right, let's talk about the colonoscopy. This is a, mm. it's a big thing that it's so important. It's, it matters so much, but people get really squeamish about it sometimes or like they don't want to do it. And we need to talk about why it's so important. So talk about exactly what the colonoscopy is, and then we'll kind of go through some bullet points. Sure. So um, the colonoscopy is a procedure where a patient is sedated. Uh, they don't remember anything. It takes about 30 minutes to do it. Once the anesthesiologist gives the medicine, the patient closes their eyes. When they open them up, it's over with. The worst part about the test is that you have to clean out your colon the, the night before. We'll talk about that in a sec. And the reason why, that we do this test is to screen for colon cancer. About roughly one in 25 or 4% of men or people will develop colon cancer within their lifetimes. And so because that's a relatively high incidence, it, you know, we've shown that people die less from colon cancer if we screen for it. What we're looking for on colonoscopy, as I, you know, when the patient's asleep, we take a flexible camera, insert it in the rectum, and then look throughout the whole colon. And what we're looking for are polyps. Polyps are little growths in the colon. You can kind of consider them like skin tags almost. They're not skin tags, but analogous to that uh, within the colon. And they don't cause trouble uh, until they grow bigger over time and they can turn into colon cancer. So by cutting those polyps out during the colonoscopy, we actually prevent colon cancer from happening. And it's in fact, it's really one of the few cancers that we can actually prevent. Yeah. And I think it's important to talk about how there's a lot of at-home colon cancer screenings now, mm -hmm. but you cannot remove the polyps at the at-home tests. That's correct. Yeah, the main one that you see advertised like ubiquitously is Cologuard. And it's a legitimate form of colon cancer screening. Uh, and I should say that there are a number of modalities to screen for colon cancer. And for the most part, most people should start getting screened at the age of 40, uh, 45, sorry. Uh, if you have a family history, uh, depending on the age that the, the relative was diagnosed, it might be a little bit earlier, but you can talk to your doctor about that. Um, and, uh, but the Cologuard is one of the screening tests. The colonoscopy is the other one that gets used most often. I'd say most doctors would say that the colonoscopy is the gold standard. You know, we see the whole colon. Essentially, we're not going to miss any cancers. Um, and small polyps can get missed here and there, but for the most part, it's uh, very like uh, thorough in, in checking out the colon. The Cologuard test is si certainly simpler. You give a stool sample at home, you put the sample in a box, you bring it to FedEx and they mail it off to the lab, and then they'll let your doctor know whether it's positive or negative. If it's what the test tests for is either microscopic blood, or DNA fragments of colon polyps or colon cancer. It doesn't really tell you which is which, but it just says positive or negative. And if it's positive, then the next step that really you should get is a colonoscopy. So it screens for things, um, but it can't do anything about them. It's also not as, it's really not as good of a test, I'll say. It misses 8% of colon cancer. So if you have 100 people with a cancer inside of them right now, eight of those people will have a negative test and then, you know, that can cause trouble. So most people will recommend, most doctors, I think would recommend doing the colonoscopy, but Cologuard is acceptable as well. You do the Cologuard every three years. And if you don't have any polyps in your colon, you would do a colonoscopy every 10 years. Yeah. But the, the people out there who might've had a positive Cologuard, most of them are going to have a negative colonoscopy, right, Chris? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point too. Just because the colon guard is positive does not mean you have colon cancer necessarily. In fact, it's still unlikely, but you don't know until you check. So we're going to talk about symptoms for colon cancer in a second, but you know, everybody talks about the prep, the prep, the prep, even my mom's like, the worst part about it is drinking that junk. And <laughs> so I feel that like, it's important to say 
that that is so easy compared to having to have cancer surgery or go through chemo or go through radiation. And in fact, I'll just a personal story that my uncle, he like refused to get a colonoscopy and got colon cancer. And it's been, I mean, thank God he's doing well. I mean, he's 81. Um, but it's like the chemo and the radiation has been hell, you know, and my aunt's like, I told you, I told you so, you know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's important for people to say that like, yes, sometimes drinking the prep and like having to go to the bathroom could be annoying, but like it's way 24 hours is way easier than having to get treatment for colon cancer. Yeah. And I will say, I mean, the annoyance of the prep, in my opinion, gets a little overblown. <laughs> and in fact, we have newer formulations of the colon prep, I will say. Back in the day, if you got a colonoscopy 20 years ago, you were probably prescribed this giant four liter bottle called Go Lightly. And it tasted like drinking seawater and it was miserable. Um, nowadays, we have smaller volume preps that are flavored. I don't know if they're flavored that good, but anyway, it's better than it was. They're usually two small bottles in a kit. You drink one of the bottles the night before, one of the bottles the morning of, and you chase each one with water, and then that'll do the trick. Lastly, we actually do have pills for a prep now, um, which a lot it appeals, appeals to a lot of people, especially those that just can't tolerate large amounts of liquid. Um, they are large pills, you know, and you take 12 the night before and 12 the morning of, and you chase it with water too, and that can do the trick. Cool. All right. Symptoms of colon cancer before we move on to the awesome topic of hernias. But I think it's important <laughs> to talk about some symptoms. So symptoms, most, uh, so we're seeing, I'll say typical symptoms of colon cancer. You don't want symptoms from colon cancer, I'll say. Once you develop symptoms, the cancer is usually advanced. And so that's why screening is so important because this is a silent cancer until it's not, and then it's more dangerous. Um, but certainly if you have blood in your stool, really if you have any amount of blood in your stool, if it has never been investigated, you really have to see a doctor about it. Even a small amount of blood can signal that there's something more serious going on. Um, and most of the time we'll have to in investigate further. Sometimes people will have abdominal pain or a change in bowel habits. Like if you were go always going regularly and now, you're getting bad pain and constipation, that could be a symptom. And then it finally, if your doctor ever tells you that you're anemic, if you've never had health problems and your blood counts are low, usually the next step that we do will be a colonoscopy to see if there's a tumor. But fortunately with screening, um, the incidence of cancer in, I'll say the 50 and older population is decreasing but we're noticing that there's an increase in the incidence of colon cancer in younger folks. That's why about a, two years ago, the recommendation for the age of onset of screening was changed from 50 to 45 because we're seeing that. Really quick, I just read an article, and I don't know if this is true or not, where they're saying that they think the onset of colon cancer in young people is from like extremely processed red meat and extra sugar. Like, do you think, is there any truth to that or... There's a lot of speculation out there. Certainly, you know, especially in America, our diet, you know, there's a lot of processed food. Obesity is very prevalent. Diabetes is on the rise. Alcohol consumption is quite high. The, all, all the usual suspects are usually what is, you know, smoking, alcohol, obesity. Those are the things that are associated with it now, but there's no smoking gun. Yeah. Um, really quick, uh, somebody just talked, uh, wrote into the chat and said, had a colonoscopy recently. The prep actually wasn't that bad. It wasn't even as close as I feared. I'm glad I went and did the procedure. And yeah, someone said, I had my colonoscopy procedure done. My doctor said, if I came a year later, our conversation would have been differently. I go faithfully. So there you go yeah. from actual patients. All right, let's talk <laughs> about hernias. So hernias are very common, especially in men. Are there any ways to prevent them? How do you know you have a hernia? What do you do to treat the hernia? All right, all right. So uh, it's more, hernias are more common in men because men have testicles, most men, cisgendered men. And when we are in our mama's belly, our testicles are in 
our abdomen. And then as we pass through the vaginal canal or whatever, the, the testicles slide down and end up in the scrotum. Hmm. Where they do that, through the lower abdomen, might, so a hernia is a weakness in the muscle where like the intestines or fat inside the belly push through. So sometimes babies are born with hernias. I was actually born with a double hernia. So my claim to fame is the guy who fixed my double hernia because I'm from outside of Philly was C. Everett Coop. So if anyone remembers the older people on this chat, you know, remember him as being the Surgeon General. Um, so oh, he what? fixed my double hernia. Oh, he was like the Surgeon General. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember under which president, but he was the Surgeon General. So, That's but fancy. most people, most people, if they're going to develop hernias, uh, they they tend to develop as we get older because our abdominal muscles get weaker. But sometimes you see this in teenagers that no one picked up. You know, this is why we do hernia checks in uh, athletes because it can cause a problem. The intestines can push through that hernia through that abdominal wall and it could get trapped and that would actually be a surgical emergency. So people who have hernias tend to notice a bulge in their groin. Um, so it's in, okay, so it's lower. It's not like you're, it's below your stomach almost. It's below the belly button, okay. literally in the groin, right above your junk. <laughs> yeah, because I've you've seen it like on TV and some people are like, oh, I have a hernia. Don't, could you live with the hernia? You don't have to get it repaired right away? If it's not bothering you, um, not painful. I, I tell my patients, well, first of all, don't strain on the toilet, so don't be constipated. And Chris, I like to say an apple a day keeps the proctologist away because apples there have good go. fiber. Um, uh, you'll notice, a patient will notice it's a problem if it's turning purple, really painful, then it has to get fixed. So it's actually um, on the outside of the skin. Like you can see it? You see a bulge. There is a bulge. So some people have belly button hernias. There's all different kinds of hernias. Some people have had surgery in their abdom, abdomen and then you something bulges through. But it's very common to have a belly button hernia in men and women. Okay. Um, but a groin hernia, we see this in women, but it's much more common in men. And it's on the side, like sort of right above the hip. Got it. And I'd say too, I, if, if I had a nickel for every patient I had, maybe a few nickels, <laughs> of men who have hernias and they're big and they'll be painful and they'll pop out and I'll be like, and I'll be examining their abdomen for some complaint and I'll say, oh, what's the deal with that? They're like, oh, well, you know, I just push it in from time to time when it gets painful. Sometimes these things are massive. And the concern is that if the, the intestines goes through that hole and it cuts off the blood supply, it could, the the gut that it, part of intestine could actually die. So in that, that's called an incarcerated hernia. It's a medical emergency. So if you're having intermittent symptoms, definitely go see your doctor. Wow. Okay. So not it, to be too, uh, too scary. No, but it's, imp I think it's important because like we started this conversation with you both saying, or Dr. Levine even saying that like men don't go to the doctor because they think they're fine. And so I think it's really important to say like, no, hernias are not just something you just push back in, like get it checked out. Yes. Absolutely. I think it's important to say also like for surgery that virtual offers min minimally evasive and robotic assisted options. So it could be this, it's very, very likely to be like a very quick same day procedure. Right. This is like bread and butter surgery for the surgeons. And Sure, people might be, you know, very uncomfortable for a week or two, but it's not severe pain. Um, you know, we just tell them don't do heavy lifting for maybe six weeks. Yeah. You know, but but someone who's like a gym bunny and goes to the gym all the time and really straining with the heavy weights, uh, a hernia could pop out. <laughs> right. Doing squats and deadlifts, being like, yo, bro, let me see how much I could lift, you know? And then yeah, they're like true. popping it. Then they run to the locker room, pop their hernia back in. Like, not cool. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So this is important. We got to talk digestive digestive issues in men. They tend to be ignored. They're brushed off as just something didn't agree with my stomach. How do you know if you need to see a GI specialist? I think also, and I'm speculating, and you two are the doctors, but it seems like men are always talking about heartburn or they're talking about, you know, um, GERD or, you know, they're talking, just saying that like, oh, What's the other word for it where like it bubbles up? 
Acid reflux. Acid reflux, yeah. right. <laughs> Talking about acid reflux. Karen, oh, just popping some Tums. And I'm always like, I don't think that that's like normal. There's probably, you know, it's probably something else going on. So let's dive into that. Well, so when I'm seeing a patient with a new complaint, um, you know, one of the things I'll always focus on pretty much on every visit are things called alarm symptoms. So these are symptoms that a patient might be having that indicate that, okay, we at least need to talk about this more, or we need to do some testing to make sure there's nothing else going on. Those would be things like trouble swallowing. When you swallow, does food get stuck in your chest? If you're having blood in your stool, if you're losing weight unintentionally, if you're waking up in the middle of the night with symptoms of whatever pain or diarrhea. Uh, that said, you know, as you said, GI symptoms are extremely common and literally everyone experiences them. But if you have any of those symptoms or any symptoms that are going on for, let's say, more than a couple of weeks, definitely talk to your doctor. Um, one thing that you mentioned was uh, acid reflux, and that's extremely you common. You mentioned it. I didn't remember what it was called. <laughs> oh, that's right. Gerd, heartburn. <laughs> so if you've had, uh, if you're a man, actually, and you have had heartburn uh, that you're taking medication for for a long time, or if you have uncontrolled symptoms that you're taking medicine and it's not doing the trick, uh, you should really see one of us. The reason for that is because we at least want to talk about management because heartburn and acid reflux is basically the main risk factor for a certain type of esophageal cancer. And so in men that have had uh, heartburn for a long time, oftentimes we'll want to do a test called an upper endoscopy uh, to see if they have a precancerous condition of the esophagus called Barrett's esophagus. And if we do see that, Sometimes we do surveillance regimens where you might get a scope periodically, but sometimes we can actually treat that and ablate it and prevent esophageal cancer from happening. And you can get a twofer, you know, when you get your colonoscopy, get your upper endoscopy. <laughs> oh, can you? Can you do that at the same time? Hopefully with a oh, yeah. different scope. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, that's the joke. <laughs> so, I don't know, but that's good. Yeah. If, you're, if you're already under, why not get both checked out? Well, yeah, I mean, if it's indicated, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Not like, <laughs> yeah. You're not just being like, yo, doc, just stick a couple tubes <laughs> <Yeah>. in me. <laughs> exactly. Hold on, can I ask Chris a question? Um, yeah. Since we're talking about, you know, heartburn, so a lot of people are, will take medications. Some of them are over the counter now, like Prilosec OTC. Those are what's called proton pump inhibitors. But a lot of my patients will come to me and they say, oh, you know, I heard that this can give you Alzheimer's. Yeah, so, okay. So there was a study a few years ago. Uh, Sorry, where Nicole, they, your thunder. <laughs> no, this is probably the most one of the most common You two are supposed questions. to be the talk and not me. <laughs> yeah, this is probably one of the most common questions we get in the office. So uh, there was a study uh, back in the day, let's say 10 years ago, that you know it was not a good scientific study for it to make conclusions from, but it basically threw stuff against a wall and see what sticks. These medications, proton pump inhibitors, are things like Prilosec, Nexium, Dexalon, Prevacid. You see them everywhere. They're advertised everywhere because heartburn is so common. And so people were studying whether or not these medications, they seem benign, they seem like there's no side effects, but are there unintended long-term side effects that we're not picking up? Uh, that initial study suggested that there may be some things that go wrong down the line. And it pointed out things like uh, dementia, kidney damage, um, bone loss, infections, things like that. Suffice to say, things like dementia and kidney damage have essentially been disproven. The bone, lo the bone loss issue is still a bit debatable, but it usually applies to postmenopausal women who are already at risk for osteoporosis or osteopenia. Uh, the one thing that has been proven is that there's a slight uptick in the amount of GI infections, like GI bugs someone might get if they're on this medication, but whether or not that's actually clinically significant to forego treatment for your acid reflux, um, you know, I'll leave it up to you, but I don't, I don't really think it is. Let me take it back really quick because I have two questions. One, what really is the difference between heartburn, acid, re acid reflux, GERD? And then also like, should you take, like wh what causes it enough that you're taking these over-the-counter medications? Should you just keep doing it, right? Like 
if you're getting it, there must be something wrong, I'm assuming. Sometimes. Uh, so to answer the question, um, I'll say acid reflux is not, it's an easy term to say, but it's not usually a term that's technical. <laughs> so heartburn is the symptom, which is sort of a burning uh, feeling in the chest. It's kind of warm and uncomfortable. The other symptom of GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease is regurgitation. So if you belch and, you know, I threw up in my mouth a little bit, that's basically regurgitation. <laughs> so heartburn and regurgitation are the two symptoms of GERD. Um, is there something wrong? Well, not always. Sometimes it's young, healthy people that just have that sphincter muscle at the bottom of their esophagus that relaxes too much and it just comes up. But we see a lot of young people that have exercise induced acid, like GERD, um, you know, when they go running or something like that. That's a minority of patients. Many patients that I do see will have something called a hiatal hernia. We were talking about a hernia. A hiatal hernia is not a hernia that you can actually see on the outside of someone, but it's where part of the stomach slips up through the diaphragm into the chest. And what it does is it just, it's not usually dangerous, but it weakens the barrier between the stomach and the esophagus so stuff can reflux up easier. I will say though that probably the most common explanations for reflux that we see, one is being overweight. Being overweight just puts more pressure on the stomach and stuff comes up easier. And also people's diet, things like, you know, there are a lot of food triggers like caffeine, spicy food, greasy food. These things, these are the things that uh, cause the esophageal sphincter to relax too much and stuff comes up. So it's always an uncomfortable conversation with a patient saying, well, you know, consider what you're eating. You know, if you lose some weight, it might get better. But at the end of the day, those are really the things that will have the most long lasting success. Well, I think it's important to talk about, I mean, you mentioned the American diet, right? And also, I mean, it's amazing that we live in a time where modern medicine exists, but also like we have really crappy food a lot of times too, and easily accessible food. So what happens is, is people don't feel good and you're like, are you eating a vegetable? Like maybe you need to change your diet. And they're like, eh, I'll just take a pill. So it's that balance of like, sometimes you have to put in the work and like really eat a better diet and not just take a pill to fix it. And then if you're doing all the things and it's still not working, well, then it's like a combination of both. I think it's important. Not too many people talk about that. And I'm like, sometimes, yeah, like you, you can't be eating the fast food and like the Doritos, like that might be why you're, you don't feel good, you know? And don't be eating it at nine o'clock, a heavy meal, and then going to bed at 10 and laying down right Yeah. Right. So let's talk Absolutely. about, let's talk about diet. And if it matters, like, can you reverse um, digestive issues? And let's also like, People talk about probiotics. They talk about fiber. The Mediterranean diet is a really hot topic right now. Um, but also on the flip side, so is keto, right? Because people want to lose weight, but keto is very high in fat. So can we like dive into that a little bit? Oh, who's, <laughs> okay, I'll pick that one first. That's a tough one. Um, I'll start with probiotics. That's an easy one. Um, they're, uh, probiotics get marketed a lot. Um, but there's not really a lot of evidence that they do anything. Uh, the science will be there one day where, you know, we appreciate the importance of the gut microbiome. Now. I mean, I'm still buying my $60 bottle Which, of probiotics because I believe it's real. Well, that's, oh, that's exactly what I'm talking. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about is, uh, yeah. And so probiotics, I mean, in very narrow circumstances, have they shown to be clinically like beneficial? Uh, but again, a lot of it's marketing. So what I tell patients, um, but patients, some patients do see benefit with it. Um, so I'll say, well, if you're interested in taking it, you know, pick one out that you like, or that appeals to you, uh, because there's not a lot of evidence that one is better than the other, to be quite honest and try it for a couple months. If you feel better, great, continue it. It's not going to hurt you, but, you're, um, but you're thinking it's a placebo, aren't you? Just say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, not necessarily there. I mean, I don't, we don't really understand it all. So maybe this is someone that needs that type of bacteria. Yeah. Um, but then there might be a placebo. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> so, but if it, if it helps, keep it going. If it doesn't help, don't waste your money. Um, I will say too. Okay. So fiber, 
fiber is actually really important because it does a couple things. One, it, I feel like it's the regulate the great regulator of the GI tract. If your stool is too hard, it can soften it a bit. If it's too loose, it can bulk it up a bit. But it's also good, for, like soluble fiber is also good for controlling cholesterol. So usually we recommend trying to get 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day, which is very difficult to do, especially on the American diet, unless you're really trying. So if you wanted to go all natural diet way, you would look for things like beans, 100% whole wheat products, you know, oats, uh, a lot of vegetables have high fiber, uh, some fruits do, things like that. But then there's Apples. also a lot of Apples with the skin on it. I will Apples say. and pears have about five grams of fiber for a good size. You know, it stinks if you're allergic. I have a birch pollen allergy and can't eat apples. Story for another day. <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but one thing, more thing on fiber is that there's tons of products out there now too. Uh, so there's things like fiber one, you'll see it in the cereal aisle or the granola bar aisle. There's, uh, you know, all these lighter breads and stuff. They're packed with fiber and that's how they make it light. So it's never been easier to get fiber, but sometimes you have to take something else. Well, let me ask both of you this, though. You brought up the fiber one bars, right? It's, yeah, there's fiber in it, but it's all processed crap. So it's like chocolates on top of it. They're throwing in like a dried cranberry. Like, is it better to eat that than not have the fiber? Right. Yeah, it's a depends tough one too. Yeah. Depends what your problem is. Yeah, I right, guess. Right. You know, it's, uh, so I don't mean to throw the hard-hitting questions at you. I mean, you're better, better off getting it naturally, like, you know, yeah. really fresh fruits and vegetables. That sort of takes you to that Mediterranean diet, which is full of fresh fruits, vegetables, olive oil, lean cuts of meat, chicken, fish, because you want to get your protein into. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I tell my patients, you want about 30 to 35 grams of fiber if they're having problems with constipation and to sort of mentally calculate how much fiber they're getting in the day. And also the problem with some of the fiber supplements, like the FiberCon pills, people don't drink enough water. So, you know, you got to drink a lot of water, mm -hmm. lots of water. 40 ounces, people. Good girl. <laughs> It's a lot of water, but like, I actually probably drink two or three of these a day, but I really do think it works. Like it matters. Like it's like for your skin, your hair, like everything, you know what I mean? And that, and that's just their outer look, not to mention inside, but like, you know, don't smoke, don't drink, you know, all that stuff. But, um, but it does, it's interesting. And I'm glad we're doing like the men's panel, because I think with women, and we talked about this in the women's panel, so much with women is about like beauty, right? And so a lot of women do things because they want to look a certain way. That same pressure is not on men, but a lot of that stuff really has to do with like how you are on the inside too, right? So like if women want to look good, they're kind of trying to be healthier where men are just kind of like, it doesn't matter. So I think it could affect them in a negative way in that degree. I'm generally, I'm generalizing obviously. Yeah. And the things that you would do to look good, you know, get a lot of, get a lot of sleep, you know, limit your alcohol intake, uh, drink a lot of water. I mean, those are going to have other effects too. So it's not yeah. just, it's done for the beauty aspect, but it's got other effects. So there's a couple questions in the Q and A. Um, and then there's also a couple questions that we had from our attendees. So we're going to jump into that really quick. And the first one is prostate cancer. Are there any warning signs? When I go to the urologist, I have to pee in a cup. Why? What are they taking? And with acid reflux, when should you be concerned enough to talk to the doctor? All right. I'm going to take the first two or so. So for prostate cancer, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of warning signs unless it's spread to the bone. Prostate cancer tends to go to bone. So my patients that have advanced prostate cancer, they have unexplained back pain or hip pain. And when we do an x-ray, we see something that shouldn't be there. You know, so it's not necessarily um, enlarged prostate symptoms where a man has urgency to pee or they're peeing every hour because their prostate's enlarged and they don't completely empty their bladder. Um, in terms of why they get they do a urine test, they're probably doing a urine test. They're looking for microscopic blood. And I want to talk about that real quick because I've had a bunch of patients, and this happened to my father, where male patients, where they, 
urinated and there was blood and then they went somewhere like urgent care and they were told, oh, you have a urinary tract infection, but they didn't have any symptoms, no burning when they peed, they weren't having urgency, they had blood. That would be bladder cancer until proven otherwise and they really need to get evaluated. That's really right? good. Enough. Yeah, yeah. So when they're, the test of the, when they're peeing in a cup, what are they testing for? Well, they're looking for infection like white blood cells and red blood cells. There you go. Okay. So could you do a, a would they do a blood test and a urine test? They do both? Usually a urologist is going to do a, a PSA, PSA. Um, on most men, but that is only once a year. Medicare and most insurances only cover a PSA once a year. Yeah. All right. So acid reflux, when should you talk to the doctor? Yeah, I would say... You know, if you're finding that you need to be on medication daily, definitely mention it to your doctor. If you're having those symptoms, like I mentioned, uh, you know, food getting stuck or you feel it going down or you got to drink water in between bites of food to get it down, definitely that. If you're losing weight, if it hurts to swallow. And of course, if you've ever spit up blood or kind of like vomited blood, it, it sounds maybe obvious, but not all the time. <laughs> yeah. So. But, um, but I would say if you're, if you need to be on those medications every day, definitely talk to your doctor. That's probably the most common one. Yeah. Sorry. Intermittent fasting. That was another question. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I have patients, I'm sorry. I, just, I yeah, have yeah, patients who, who do it. Uh, you know, basically why do people lose weight with intermittent fasting is because you're not eating as many calories. You have like, you, most of it, you have an eight hour window of when you eat. Um, I will say that a lot of my patients have more energy with intermittent fasting, especially if it's like an eight to four, eight in the morning, the four in the afternoon. And that goes in general. You know, I, I can't tell you when the best time to eat your heavy meal is, but probably dinner is not the best time. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe noon is. Yeah. So, okay. So these, these are two interesting ones. Is it true that bike riding is a no-no for suspected prostate cancer? Uh, so probably... That issue arises when if you're riding your bike and you're pounding on your prostate, you know, going over bumps, and then you get a PSA test the next day, it might be falsely elevated. The same goes for actually having sex the day before getting your PSA done. We're going to go know. into sexual health for a minute in yeah. one second, because we didn't talk about that yet. And I think that that's important to talk about. Um, can you get a hernia more than once? So... Depends on how they fix the hernia. It's a lot of times they'll put a mesh in there. So you, sometimes the mesh could get loose or if they just sew you up, it could get loose, but you can have, you know, a hernia on the left side of your groin and then the following year have one on the right side. Yeah, right. So it kind of just depends. So we got to talk about sexual health for men, L fixing a low sex drive, obviously erectile dysfunction and also like just sexual health in general, like getting tested for STDs. That's, you know, they really encourage that for a lot of gay men, but like they really should encourage it for straight men as well. I think that's important to talk about. All right, as the family doctor, um, you know, I usually will take a bit of a sexual history yeah. on my patients and find out if there are any risk factors for getting STDs checked. And the STDs that we check would be a blood test for HIV and syphilis. And then we do a urine test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. If um, there's a man, I, I don't know how they identify, but if they have insertive anal sex, they're the bottom, then I might do an anal or rectal swab for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And we might do an oral swab as well. So it all depends on risk factors. Yeah. In terms of sex drive, that is the real tough one because honestly, as men get older, sex drive goes down and it may or may not have anything to do with testosterone. Talking about testosterone could be a whole hour talk. Um, it tends to go down as we get older, but it, you know, if you start getting testosterone replacement, it can cause other problems and speed up prostate cancer and cause liver problems and acne and anger issues. And it may not help sex drive at all just because your testosterone is low. You know, so testosterone is a tough answer. The best thing, my answer for everything again is exercise, minimize stress, get enough sleep, don't smoke. All those things can help with erection problems. And, and I talk to my patients, especially as you get older, you have so many more things going on in your head. You know, you got to get out of your head. You've got to, you know, be kind to your partner. Um, 
I, and I tell, ask my patients, so if you're on vacation, is your sex drive better? And they're like, yeah. I said, yeah, because you're not as stressed out. You're not home. Uh, so stress is one of the biggest killers. Yeah. It's so good. You know, we didn't talk about mental health, right? We didn't talk about men and therapy and anxiety and depression. Let's touch upon that really quick because again, women have no problems talking to their friends about being overwhelmed, being stressed, feeling depressed, feeling anxious. Men really don't talk about that with each other. So I think this is a really great time to encourage that. If you, even if you want to send your doctor a no, a telehealth visit or go into your doctor and talk about that, because it's, it's very, very, very common and it's really important for overall health and well being. Yeah. I mean, my patients talk to me about it all the time. That's good. You yeah. Know, but I, that's, you know, obviously a select population that are going to the doctor. Right. Uh, most in, in primary care, when the medical assistant takes a patient back, they will ask some screening questions for depression. Okay. So, right. And so if they answer positive, the doctor usually will discuss that. Yeah. Back to um, ED, because somebody asked this about Viagra, like, when is that prescribed or could somebody just ask for it or is it talking to your doctor and then they get prescribed? Yeah. So, oh, you can do a teledoc somewhere and get it prescribed too. Right. right? Um, right. I mean, I've had some patients in their, some male patients in their twenties who need it more for anxiety reasons. Uh, it's anytime someone's having problems with erections, they should talk to their provider about it because actually, as we get older, erection problems can be an indicator of heart disease. So, really? Right. So poor blood supply maybe can cause erection problems. What Viagra does is it dilates blood vessels. It was actually investigated to help with a, a disorder called pulmonary hypertension. And so when it was studied in the patients, it didn't really help so much with pulmonary hypertension, but lo and behold, it helped with their erections. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So Here's another question. I was diagnosed with acid reflux two years ago, went through a swallow test and endoscopy to find out what was happening with me. I take medication called hyrosicamine. It's working wonders with me. So I think that was just like a statement. Is that some kind of special medicine? Well, hyoscyamine or levsin is a Close. tablet that dissolves, <laughs> is the one that dissolves under the tongue and it's for spasms of the GI tract. Okay. So we use it a lot for like irritable bowel syndrome or people that have abdominal cramping or diarrhea. Um, and sometimes we'll use it for people that have these chest or complaints that sound like it's acid reflux, but it may actually be esophageal spasms where the muscles of the esophagus will just have intense, strong contractions um, that can mimic a heart attack, sometimes mimic acid reflux. But usually we start by treating the acid levels and then only after a certain, uh, only after a series of investigations would we, you know, prescribe a medication like that. Okay. So this person went through all the right steps where he got exactly. over. Yeah. Yep. So that's really important to get. Oh, something that's not in here that I just thought of though is sleep apnea. Cause that seems to be a big thing with men too. Can you talk about that really quick? I just kind of was going through the questions and thought about it. Interesting. I just had a patient today who is convinced he has sleep apnea. And when he had his colonoscopy, they had yeah. trouble waking him up or thought, oh my God, we need to get him up. Um, so sleep apnea is when you actually stop breathing while you're sleeping and you could stop breathing hundreds of times a night and not realize it. But then when you wake up, you don't feel well rested. It tends to be car it tends to correlate with a lot of snoring, um, bed partners elbowing them. And a lot of bed partners say, oh my God, you stopped breathing when you were sleeping. Right. So people might wake themselves up choking, gasping. Some risk factors for that would be people that are overweight, have a very large neck, like a greater than a 17. Interesting, that's one of the questions you asked. My female patients have no idea what their neck sizes are. Um, older male right, patients tend to know. Because men know their neck size because of shirts, collared shirts. If they wear them, right, but not not so much nowadays. But right, right. Yeah. Um, alcohol can can be a problem with sleep apnea, and it can cause a lot of long term complications with your heart, with your lungs, and you know it's a relatively simple fix with a CPAP machine. Not everyone tolerates it, but my patients who tolerate it come back and say, "Oh my God, I didn't realize I was so fatigued until I start using my CPAP." 
And there are people that snore that don't have sleep apnea. So that's something, again, like talk to your doctor about because you could just be really annoying and snore, but it could be like a deviated septum or it could just be that you have like whatever that is. Snore. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, a lot of men seem to talk about the the sleep apnea aspect of it, but it could all go, go hand in hand. Um, so what are some wrap up a piece of advice that each of you have? I would, uh, okay. I would just say, don't ignore symptoms. You know, we, I have a lot of men that I've seen in the office, um, who have had rectal bleeding, you know, in some, it it may be intermittent for the past year or months or whatever, and it ends up being something serious. But a lot of times, especially if a man's never been ill in their life, uh, they may try to just brush these things off as, oh, it just, it's probably nothing. It'll go away but there's never been a person on this earth who has escaped disease and it happens to everybody. It's hard to acknowledge that, but the earlier you address these symptoms, the better your outcome will be and, you know, do it for your family as well. And get a colonoscopy. Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or, um, or the colo guard, I call it the bucket challenge because literally (laughs) you poop in a bucket. (laughs) That's true. Wait, really? Uh, your own bucket or they send a bucket? They send a bucket in the box, in the Colo Guard box. Wow. You don't you don't squat you don't squat in the kitchen. You put it on top of the toilet. Okay. <laughs> and then yeah. you, you're just like this. Right like well, it, it comes with like a bracket. You put it in between the toilet seat and the rim and you poop in the bucket. I think you have to do a little sample of something in a yeah. little separate container. And then you screw the top back on and you mail it back. And listen, people are like, sometimes like, ew, poop. But so many people have dogs. It's like, you're picking up your dog poop, your kid poop. Like, it. listen, you just like be an adult. You know what I mean? Gag a little bit and keep it moving, you know? By the way, about the colon, not everyone is a good candidate. People have had cancers. If you've ever had rectal bleeding, you know, not a good candidate for for the colon. Yeah. Or Um, or if you've had polyps before, I will say. If you've had polyps before, it doesn't, it's not a good test. Yeah. I don't, did you, you didn't give any advice though, Dr. Levine. Uh, well, my keys to longevity really is four things and they're obvious, get enough sleep, eat healthy, exercise regularly, and try to minimize stress. Well, what would you say the best thing for minimizing stress is? When you say that, I think a lot of people would say, well, how do I do that? Like what, what would be a, just one piece of advice, a starting point on how to minimize stress? Well, you got to recognize what your stressors are right. and see what you can do to minimize your stress. But again, exercise, and I'm not saying being a fanatic about it, but yeah. go for a walk for a half an hour, an hour, three or four days a week. You yeah. know, it does wonders for your psyche. Yeah. But my other advice is, you know what, as we get older, we're not going to be 20 again. Yeah. You know, so just recognize our bodies are not what they were. We're not going to be able to do, I mean, some people still do marathons, but you know, most people in their seventies aren't going to do marathons. Yeah. You know, recognize what you have and enjoy every day. Yeah. You know, I think in, in, with exercise, people assume because we got with social media and the internet, it got, so you have to do CrossFit and you have to feel like you're going to die every time, but it's like going for a 45 minute walk and listen to your favorite music or your favorite radio station, 92.5 XEU <laughs> or a podcast or a book, or just like listening to nature. You know what I mean? Like there was a really funny meme that talked about like people wanting to listen to music on the beach. They're like, what mother nature soundtrack isn't good enough for you. But like, um, we live so close to the, imagine just like walking on the beach for 45 minutes, you know, and just getting sunlight and vitamin, natural vitamin D, right? Like all those things. And doing yoga. Yeah. So yeah. I just moved back from Texas after living there for six years. And I was kind of like in the middle of North Texas. There wasn't a lot of natural beauty. And it's just, I always took it for granted living in this area of the country where you're so close to the the mountains, the shore, the forest and cities, culture, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, take advantage of it. Yeah. I mean, I was just in Tuscany and everyone's like, wow, Tuscany. I'm like, I mean, like. Have you ever been to Poconos? Like, it's pretty beautiful there. Like, sounds a little crazy, but I was like, mm, okay. Like, I mean, it's pretty, but like, if you ever go to Jim Thurb d- during fall foliage, I mean, it's pretty breathtaking. <laughs> um, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up like two minutes from Jim Thorpe, but now I'm a city gal. But yeah, there's so much. There's the beach, the mountains. Like, I think that it goes back to stress and like, 
sometimes when you get older, especially men, right? Like they're in their fifties, sixties. I mean, obviously I'm not a man in my sixties, but like, they just feel like I got to work, you know, got to provide. And they don't really think like, wait, I actually really like the beach or I actually like to ride a bike or I actually really love to listen to history books. So it's like figuring out like that 30 to 60 minutes, even like three times a week to just better yourself physically and mentally. Yeah. Um, all right. So just to wrap up really quick, it's your body. And if it's not functioning the way you want it to, there is help. I think that that's like the theme is that don't be afraid to be preventative and ask for help. And so whether you're feeling under the weather or a chronic condition, or you just need a routine physical exam, Virtua Primary Care offers an array of services to meet our needs of patients. So for more information, to schedule an appointment, just go to virtua.org slash primary near you. If you're experiencing any digestive issues, like we talked about, such as gurgles, burbles, aches or pains, Virtua GI and digestive health can help. And that's virtua.org slash digestive help. Very easy. And then as always, a recording is going to be emailed to you in the next week. And once we end the session, your web, your web browser is going to redirect you to the survey and you can win a $10 Target gift card. How per, I mean, who doesn't love free money to Target? It's almost as good as your health. <laughs> so a special thank you for sharing your feedback. You'll receive a $10 Target gift card sent to your email after completing the survey. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful experts. Really appreciate it for another terrific Real Talk session. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys. Thank you.